Greetings, folks. Welcome back to my little corner of the library. As far back as people have had a concept of the devil, stories have been told of those who have tried to sell him their souls. Theophilus of Edena tried to sell his in exchange for influence and power. Blues legend Robert Johnson supposedly sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads in exchange for musical ability. Movies have been made about the idea, and songs have been sung. But for all of that, none, no story has been so famous or lasting as that of Dr. Faust, a bored but brilliant German magician who summons Mephistopheles, the devil's ward, and sells him his soul in exchange for all worldly knowledge. What I'm willing to bet you didn't know, however, is that Dr. Faust was a real person. Now, my name's Dan, you're watching Bookworm History, and this is The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. According to historian Frank Bacon, the real Faust was born Georg Helmstetter in Helmstadt, Germany, around 1466. In 1483, the brilliant young man enrolled at the University of Heidelberg, where he graduated in 1487 at the tender age of 21 with a Master's of Philosophy. Now, that was the minimum age required to earn that degree, and it was the highest degree that could possibly be earned. By 1490, he was passing himself off as a soothsayer, learned in astrology and chiromancy, the science of reading palms. According to a business card of his that we have, he was known as the chief of necromancers, palmist, diviner with earth and fire, and second in the art of divination with water. He would use many names over the years, but by 1513 it would seem he had settled on one. Like most learned men in the age of humanism, he turned to Latin to pick his name, ultimately calling himself Georg Faustus, Faustus being the Latin term for lucky or fortunate. As his reputation would grow, he would acquire several powerful patrons, and with that would find himself at odds with several other devious enemies. One in particular, Trithemius, a rival magician, would publish a book of letters accusing Faustus of sodomy, pedestry, and dealing in the dark arts. Now, of this book of letters that Trithemius published, two things should be noted. One, this was the only time during Faust's lifetime that he would be linked with the occult. Astrology and chiromancy were actually accepted sciences, fringe sciences nonetheless, but still accepted in the realm of learned men. However, the occult and dark arts were still considered to be very taboo. Thing number two, Trithemius himself was in some hot water at the time. He was actually ducking accusations of dealing in occult and illicit magical practices, uh, so he could have been trying to divert attention away from himself and onto Faustus as a mean of displacing blame. 1536 would bring the last reference to a living Faustus. He was doing horoscopes for a patron, and he was aged 70 years old. We don't know how he died, when he died, or where he was buried. In 1537, a book was published by a follower of Martin Luther, which contained several conversations that Luther had supposedly had with the author, one of which says that Faust was known as the brother-in-law to the devil. In Wittenberg, Germany, which was Luther's hometown, a follower of Luther's named Philip Melanchthon would actually preach that Faust was a magician who was closely allied with the devil. All of this probably after Faust's lifetime, and the legend would only grow from there. In 1585, another follower of Luther's, Hermann Wittgend, would publish an account of Faust's life that would actually contain several notable pieces of the legend which would later become canon. This was the first time that a pact with the devil was actually mentioned. Also mentioned was the 24-year period that the contract was supposed to last. Fast forward two more years to Frankfurt in 1587, and the appearance of the tragical life and deserved death of Dr. John Faustus. Now, the, also known as the Faust Book, it was actually written anonymously, and was published as a sort of warning to good Christians to steer clear of the black arts and any involvement with the devil. It was a highly fictionalized version of Faust's life, largely ignoring any sort of established facts, and drawing heavily on Wittgen's narrative. This book, now known as the Faust Book, would see an English translation that we know of in 1592, and it's probable that it was this book that Marlowe based his play on probably written sometime between 1592 and 1593. Now, there is a reference to an earlier edition in English as far back as 1589. Uh, the reference comes in a list in an inventory of the goods belonging to one Matthew Peckard, who was a deceased Oxford scholar who passed away at the tender age of 21 years old. Now, the book that was supposedly in his possessions was an English translation dated 1589. 
the 1592 book on its title page has this notation. It says the book was newly imprinted and in convenient places imperfect matter amended. Now that's the 1592 book, and that caption is part and parcel what you would expect from a second edition book that had corrected certain flaws in the first edition. But the 1592 book is the earliest one that we actually know of as far as having a definitive copy. Possibly one existed as far back as 1589. So it's feasible to say that Marlowe wrote the play between 1589 and 1593. The play would first be performed on stage in 1594, or at least that's the earliest reference we have to a performance. It would be published in book form first, twice, uh, initially in 1604, and then again in 1616. Now, I know that sounds weird, and it sounds like the 1616 publication should be the second time it was published, but the 1604 version is, is referred to by scholars as the A text. The 1616 version is referred to as the B text. And the reason that they're referred to as that, rather than just saying first edition or second edition, is because they are pretty incredibly different. Now, the A text, the 1604 version, clocks in at just over 1,500 lines, which is pretty short for an Elizabethan play. Uh, it's theorized that scenes may have been left out, just didn't make it to the printers, that it was an abbreviation of the original text. We don't really know. But what we do know is that in 1616, when the B text was published, it had somehow ballooned to just over 2,100 lines. Certain scenes had been added, uh, comic scenes mostly, but also uh, changes to lines and locations as well. So the question becomes, where did this new material come from? Well, we have a clue in the diary of Philip Henslow. Now, Henslow was a sort of Elizabethan theatrical entrepreneur who was a titan in his day and kept a very detailed diary and log of all financial transactions that took place within his theatrical circles. In his diary, we have a notation for four pounds being paid to two other playwrights, not Marlowe, for additions to the Faust text. So it's possible, we say, that, okay, these are the additions that changed the shorter 1604A text into the longer 1616B text. Now, that would be very convenient and easy to say and wrap your head around. The only problem with that is that the notation in the diary for the four pounds paid to the two playwrights is dated 1602, which is two years before the publication of the A text. And if you think that sounds confusing, just hold on. You see, the big problem with all of this is that they couldn't just go back and ask Marlowe what the original version was, because Marlowe had been dead for over 11 years by the time the A text ever saw the light of day as a book. In fact, he was dead for a year before the play was even performed. He had been stabbed to death in 1593 in a tavern brawl over the bill, supposedly. It was an event later referred to by Shakespeare as a great reckoning in a little room. But like everything else in Marlowe's life, it's shrouded in mystery and ambiguity. You see, we don't really know too much about Marlowe's life. And historians disagree on just about everything about him, whether he was an atheist or a Catholic, whether he was a heretic or a spy. Uh, he was arrested in 1593 in May, for supposedly for blasphemy, and he was taken before the Privy Council. Uh, the problem was, the day that he was taken before the Privy Council, the Privy Council wasn't actually seated. So he was told to come back on a daily basis and was basically instructed to be at the mercy of the council until they deemed otherwise. And ten days later, he was murdered. Was he killed in a bar brawl? Was he assassinated? What were his religious beliefs? What were his political leanings? We may never know. And because not a whole lot was written about Marlowe, similar to most other Elizabethan playwrights, historians have tried to fill in the gray areas between facts we do know, things we've gleaned from legal records or birth and death certificates, uh, with stories that seem to form a, a whole narrative. But that doesn't necessarily make them true, and occasionally makes them completely unreliable. Unfortunately, we may never know the truth, so we just have to go and do the best with what we've got. In the meantime, we've got some really good stories to tell. Well, that's all we've got for you today. If you enjoyed it, and I hope you did, please be sure to hit that like button down below. Click subscribe on your way out so you stay up to date on all of our latest episodes. As always, you can find more odd, interesting, and unusual stories either by browsing through our playlists here on YouTube, or you can head over to our website, bookwormhistory.com. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and thanks for stopping by.